morning. I'm Arthur Herman, Senior Fellow at the Hudson Institute, and I want to welcome you to a, this session to discuss uh, Hudson Institute's latest investigative commission, the commission that we've been working on regarding the international postal package system and examining what it is, what are the problems that exist, and what do we do about it. Um, our commission uh, finished its preliminary work last Friday, and so I wanted to use this event on Monday to bring you up to speed with some of the issues that we've been addressing, uh, some background on how these problems arose and the larger context in which they take place, but also, too, to give you something of a preview of what our final report is going to look like when we come down and, and develop a list of specific approaches and reforms for dealing with this problem, which has gotten to be uh, uh, quite uh, out of hand in many ways, as I think almost everybody involved in the issue of delivering uh, and shipping international postal packages will confirm. And also, too, at the same time, uh, to give you some idea about uh, where we think the future lies, uh, particularly if we don't deal with these problems and deal with these issues from the beginning. Just by way of a kind of brief introduction to a background of all of this. According to the U.S. Postal uh, Commission, uh, about 470 million pieces of foreign mail enter the U.S. in 2015, of which perhaps something like one-fifth uh, consisted of small packages. Small packages being packages of two kilos or less, about four and a half pounds or less. Now, as far as what it, those packages contain, there exists almost no advanced electronic data or ways of keeping track of what, that, what those packages contain, uh, where, they're, where they're coming from, uh, or who's doing, been involved in, in, in packing and organizing those shipping. And that's a problem, and that's a problem that's becoming an increasing issue and concern to Customs and Border Protection. It's one that's increasingly concerned to Department of Homeland Security. It's one that's becoming increasingly problematic for our law enforcement agencies because, as we'll see, among those uh, commodities being and products being shipped by those small uh, packages include illegal pharmaceuticals and illegal drugs. And it also is one that concerns the U.S. Postal Service because under the, as you'll see, uh, convoluted in many ways and certainly outdated rules imposed by the Universal Postal Union, the USPS is obliged to deliver these packages even though in so many cases it has no idea what might be contained inside them uh, or even where they've been, where they've been uh, shipped from, what kinds of companies, what kinds of uh, institutions have been sending these things out. Now, that, that, this is a problem in terms of the growth of packages, which is only going to increase. In fact, it's one of the things that our commission has come to realize uh, and, and will be reflected in our final report is, is that the USPS, in terms of foreign mail, is going to become more and more, or I should say become less and less of a deliverer of documents and letters and more and more a package shipping company. So given the growth of this with the impact of e-commerce as a growing globalized business environment, what we're facing here is a, uh, we believe, is an issue that's going to grow to really crisis proportions and ones in which all of the interested parties, all of those who can have some say or, and direction over taking important reforms and approaches must uh, undergo some sort of, some, some not only education on the issues, but also think about where to go and what to do from that point from going forward. And that includes Congress. And as Congress becomes more and more involved, also I think you'll see uh, more uh, pressure brought to bear to bring about those important reforms and what 
this commission will do is to provide for Congress and for all interested parties an overview of these problems and, as I say, some suggestions about what directions to take. Now, one of the issues that we'll see in our discussion this morning that is going to be important for all of this and for understanding and for bringing about changes has to do with the collection of data, of data of inbound foreign mail and packages. A, a system of data collection which is now uh, woefully behind, not just in a technological sense, but even in an information collecting and data collecting sense. Uh, and this is one which a number of actors, bad actors, are increasingly able to take advantage of, whether we're talking about illegal drug traffickers, whether we're talking about foreign terrorist organizations, or whether we're talking about counterfeit and illegal goods, including illegal pharmaceuticals. For example, um, between January and May of 2015, an independent consulting firm called LegitScript did a study of the shipping method used in 29 test buys from illegal online pharmacies. And what LegitScript found was that all of the purchases were being shipped into the U.S., but that only two of those illegal pharmacies existed inside the United States. The rest were all coming in from outside. And that all of those sources of illegal pharmaceuticals were using government sponsored postal services to move the illegal, illegal pharmaceuticals. In no case, legit script study concluded, did US Customs stop or intercept the package. And even worse, in all cases, the US Postal Service provided the shipping once the drugs reached the US soil. Again, without being able, without asking what was contained in the packages or demanding uh, owed customs dues. Uh, this sucks. Um, this is a problem that's got to be dealt with in many ways. And as it happens, the president and CEO of LegitScript, John Horton, was a member of our commission. Uh, other commission members included, uh, in addition to John Horton of LegitScript, included Professor Rick Geddes of Cornell University, a leading authority on the U.S. Postal Service and its infrastructure and operations. Uh, it included Sean Heather, Vice President for International and Global Policy for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And it also included uh, the three members that you have sitting on the stage today and who I am very pleased and honored to be able to introduce to you uh, and we'll all have a chance to hear what they have to say, not just about the Commission's work, but about the larger problems and issues that it's had to address. Um, starting from my left, your right, John Walters, who is also, by the way, a, a colleague of mine here at Hudson Institute, from December of 2001 to January 2009, was director of the White House Office of National Drug Policy and a cabinet member. Uh, as the nation's drug czar, John guided all aspects of federal drug policy and programs, supporting programs which, during those years, drove down teen drug use 25 percent. He also helped to set up critical programs to counter narco-terrorism in Colombia, Mexico, and Afghanistan. So John brings for us an important international perspective on drug trade and the illegal drug trafficking and uh, it, the, its impact and, its, and, and the way in which international postal package system both facilitates uh, and also serves to feed that illegal drug trafficking. John Hudak is Deputy Director of the Center for Effective Public Management and a Senior Fellow in Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution. His research has examined questions of presidential power in the context of administration, personnel, and public policy. John's book, Presidential Pork, White House Influence Over the Distribution of Federal Grants, demonstrates that pork barrel politics exists far beyond just the halls of Congress. His other work, John's other work, has also explored how agency staffing expertise and institutional structure 
facilitate or hinder presidential power and influence. And as we'll see in dealing with and confronting this problem, this is going to be one which the next president, whoever that may be, will have both an opportunity and an obligation to undertake and to find ways to explore for solutions uh, to these problems and to these issues. And then finally, Jim Campbell. As a lawyer and consultant in Washington, D.C., uh, he was a longtime advisor to Federal Express Corporation on U.S. postal reform and international postal policy. Uh, in addition, Jim in recent years has co-authored with the German Wissenschaftliches Institute for Kommunikation Dienste, in other words, the German Research Institute for Communication Services, um, several major studies of European and international postal laws and practices for the European Commission, and also a review of the history and development of postal law and the postal monopoly in the United States for the Postal Regulatory Commission, the body that is uh, supposed to oversee and have oversight over all of these kinds of issues relating to U.S. law, public policy, and the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, as I like to say, uh, Jim has been someone who's been involved in this in the, since the 1970s. Um, he is widely recognized as the nation's leading expert on the international postal system. And as I like to say, uh, what Jim doesn't know about international postal shipping and international postal post system isn't knowledge. Jim, as I mentioned, you've been looking at these issues since about the 1970s. Okay. You've been looking at it for a long time and studying it for a long time. The problems that we face today have a long history, don't they? Yes. And they go back and go back in time. Do you want to give us a little bit of a background and discussion on that? Sure. Um, maybe I'll stand up so I can sure. see these slides as I'm talking. So you're going to put them up, eh? Um, Jim, I think you're going to need a clicker for that. Here you go. Uh, thanks. thanks. OK. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It was uh, a surprise, but a great pleasure to work with Arthur and the other people on the commission. Uh, in fact, I thought I knew a lot about international post policy, but I learned a lot more from the people at the commission. So it was a real pleasure. Um, my job this morning is simply give you a little short background of um, the legal framework and the impact of the rising uh, volume of parcels in the international postal system. So the international postal services are organized by an intergovernmental agency called the Universal Postal Union or UPU. The UPU was founded in 1874. It is the second oldest international organization in the world. The uh, UPU was originally founded by 21 member countries at a time when all post offices were government departments and all had monopolies over the carriage of mail. And mail consisted of essentially letters and documents. So the UPU's original mission was simply letters and documents. Today, the UPU has 192 member countries, virtually every country in the world. It is, uh, now includes, um, among, the government, among the post offices, many corporatized and commercialized organizations. In fact, many post offices are wholly or partly privatized. And all of the major post offices are uh, very much focused on uh, the commercial business of delivering uh, packages and, um, and documents. The international postal system is dominated by the industrialized countries. So this is a slide from the UPU. Uh, it shows here at the top that the industrialized countries export about 77% of all of the documents and packages that go into the international postal system. They receive something like a similar amount. Most of the documents and packages, in fact, go between the industrialized countries. All right, there's a, an exception, however. In recent years, there's been a great rise in packages coming from Asian countries like uh, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, because of the growth in e-commerce. The international postal system consists of three basic services. The letter post, which is 
essentially the equivalent of what we would call first class mail. And it conveys documents, letters, but also packages up to four and a half pounds, two kilos. The letter post is the predominant service of the international postal system. In addition, there's the parcel post system, which is like our parcel post, and conveys packages up to 20 kilos or 44 pounds. And EMS, which is express mail service like our domestic express mail. We reorganize the shipment so that we can split out documents and packages. Roughly the situation is as follows, and it's a little bit rough. But the documents in the international postal system are about two and a half billion pieces. The documents in the, sorry, the packages in the international postal system are about a billion in 2014. Over the last few years, the document business internationally has declined drastically. It's declined about twice as fast as the decline of documents in the domestic business. At the same time, packages have grown substantially in the international postal system, particularly in the last five years. So increases from countries like China of 100% a year or more are fairly common in the industrialized countries, including the United States. If you project these forward, and this is just my projection, there's no way to know what the future is going to bring. This could be conservative, but it seems as though the number of packages will exceed the number of documents as early as 2020. The Universal Postal Convention, which establishes the legal framework, is not very well adapted to the movement of goods as opposed to simply documents. So if you compare what the private companies, and this is not just the express companies, but any cargo carrier or air freight forwarder, if you compare how they handle packages compared to how the post handles packages, the differences are fairly dramatic. So security, which is, of course, a crucial issue for everybody in the international commerce these days, the private companies, all private companies, must provide package level security data before they load a shipment onto a plane coming to the United States. So the customs authorities can make a quick check and say, do not load a dangerous package. The post offices have no such system in place today. They do not provide any advanced security information to the port of destination. When the plane arrives, the private companies are expected to provide customs with more detailed information and to provide sufficient information to clear customs. So that involves value and harmonization code and all sorts of things. Again, the post offices are not equipped to do this, at least not today, and they do not provide this sort of detailed information, and they do not fill out customs forms. Customs clearance is essentially up to the customs official who says, I want to look at that package, and then says, oh, it looks like we need to make an entry here. The private companies are liable for any mistakes. This is a necessary tool to make sure that the private companies fill out the information correctly. The post offices under the UPU convention are not liable for any false information that may be included on the outside of the package by the sender. The antitrust laws, of course, apply to private companies so that they cannot conspire to fix rates. The UPU convention does, in fact, create a price fixing agreement among the post offices so that the rates that they charge each other are not actually market rates and they're not comparable to domestic postage. And so the bottom line is that the rates that the private companies charge the shipper are essentially determined by economic considerations and by the cost of complying with the law. The prices that the post give the shipper of goods, are we okay here, give the shipper of goods, are very much influenced by the fact that the prices that they charge each other are set by this UPU agreement and by the fact that they do not incur substantial costs for complying with security and customs laws. Okay, so the results of this rather special legal regime that applies to goods shipped by post creates a lot of potential problems, as the author indicated. So among other things, you have health and safety concerns because 
as Arthur pointed out, prescription drugs coming into the country, illegal prescription drugs, apparently all come in by post, or at least the vast majority come in by post. And Customs has a hard time catching it. Experts are also concerned, and this was one of the most interesting things, and I'm sure John will talk about this more, but the potential of importing synthetic opioids like fentanyl by the international post seems to be quite serious. I don't know of any particular studies of this practice, but there's an epidemic of synthetic opioids that's killing a lot of Americans. And I know Congress is very concerned about that. In addition, of course, we have the possibility of terrorist use of international post. The terrorists have in the past put explosives into packages. In 2010 in particular, there was a big scare with some privately carried shipments. But this does not seem to be remedied by the current security arrangements for the post. In addition, it seems as though that the lack of information that's provided Customs allows shipments to come into the United States or come into various countries by post and escape the appropriate duty. So according to one recent study, the United States Treasury is losing about a billion dollars a year in lost duties because the shipments that come by post are simply not documented. In addition, the fact that the post offices charge each other according to the UPU payment schemes means that the flow of international packages and documents, but particularly packages, is quite distorted. And in many cases, it's anti-competitive. It's hurting the ability of the post offices to compete with one another and the private companies to compete with the post offices. So these are some recent studies, including the study by the Inspector General of the Postal Service. And fundamentally what these studies find is that the post offices are charging each other substantially less than they charge their own citizens for the delivery of inbound packages. As a result, the post offices, including the U.S. Postal Service, are essentially helping foreign merchants compete with the local merchants. So, for example, the undercharging by the Postal Service is essentially helping Alibaba in China compete with Amazon in the United States. And as a result, Amazon has raised a lot of red flags with Congress. In addition, because the charges are so low, the express companies like FedEx and UPS are being hurt. In particular, they're unable to cooperate with the post the way they do here in the United States. The express companies are very good at gathering packages and delivering them to the post for last mile delivery. That practice doesn't occur internationally because of this UPU convention and the charges that are organized. And the Postal Service itself appears to be losing money now as a result of this scheme. Although in former times they were a net winner, it looks like they're not only a net loser, but they're becoming increasingly a net loser. So it looks like they will be losing tens of millions of dollars a year. Okay. The good news is that Congress has done a fairly good job of modernizing the statutes. So the legal framework that the United States should be taking to international negotiations is not bad. It provides that the United States is dedicated to unrestricted and undistorted competition in the international competitive services to creating a clear distinction between governmental and operational functions. The U.S. law says that the United States is not supposed to agree to a UPU convention that fails to apply U.S. security and customs laws in the same manner, quote unquote, in the same manner to both the postal shipments and private shipments. The law also says that the United States cannot agree to a UPU convention that creates an undue or unreasonable preference for any person, including the Postal Service, and should not agree to anything that's inconsistent with U.S. antitrust laws, in other words, price fixing. In addition, U.S. trade laws commit the United States to reduce or eliminate barriers to trade and services and specifically include postal and other delivery services. So the bad news is the United States has not done a very good job of implementing this law, but we have another chance. 
The UPU is scheduled to meet in the General Congress starting tomorrow in Istanbul. The Congress is a meeting of all member countries, and they will decide on a new convention that goes into effect in 2018 and lasts until the end of 2021. Judging from the proposals currently before the Commission, it looks like the new Congress is going to more or less extend the current problems under the UPU convention, but I guess we'll have to see exactly how it turns out. This is the UPU Congress, not our Congress. I'm sorry, the UPU Congress, right. The UPU Congress, our Congress, that's another matter. But the UPU Congress is meeting again tomorrow in Istanbul, three-week meeting, decide on a new convention that will last until the end of 2021. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Now, one of the problems that arise from having a large-scale international small package delivery system provided by the USPS has been twofold. One is the degree to which, and a question that I think, the question the Commission will address directly, does this constitute in some ways a subsidy, an indirect subsidy, to foreign e-commerce companies and countries vis-a-vis our own? But the other question, of course, is the way, and that's from the point of view of legal commodities being carried in the package system. But the other important one, and perhaps in many ways the most alarming, is the degree to which this international postal package system can be used to convey illegal commodities, whether we're talking about counterfeit goods at one end or some of the most dangerous illegal drugs in the world at the other. And that's an issue that we addressed and talked about in the Commission, John. You and I, in fact, have an op-ed pending with the Wall Street Journal on this issue and the relationship between international postal system and the fentanyl epidemic. But I was thinking that you might be able to give us some more background on the size and scope of this fentanyl crisis and just the way in which getting a handle on that has to also address the means by which these drugs get into the country. Yeah, this has been a very rapidly growing problem. You've seen some reports by local communities and states, and you've seen some reports by the government. But the government, as we saw and as my own experience with substance abuse problems indicate, the government is way behind on this. The CDC announced for 2014 earlier this year because of the lag in collecting national data from medical examiners that about 45,000 people died of overdose deaths, over half those synthetic opioids, about 10,000 of them heroin overdose deaths nationwide. That's 2014. They will not have 2015 numbers out for some time, and 2016 is still probably a year and a half away. What's happened in the meantime, I think I'll illustrate by just telling you what I saw personally in Manchester, New Hampshire on Saturday, September 11th. I was invited to go up to a panel there about opioid overdose problem because New England, as some of you know, has been a particularly hard-hit area, although there are many other areas of this country that have also been hit, including areas like Maryland and Virginia. But this is an even bigger point of discussion in New Hampshire at that time. What's happening is criminal organizations are bringing in fentanyl and this powerful synthetic opioid that you have probably heard about. But to give you a sense of the power of this substance and the reason why it's both economically attractive and incredibly dangerous, fentanyl, roughly speaking, two milligrams is a lethal dose of fentanyl if it's made. And a dose for, there is no such thing as recreational use of fentanyl, would be about 100 micrograms as far as I can tell from what we do know about this. What that means is a kilo or 2.2 pounds is 10 million doses. 
and 500,000 lethal doses. Um, the economics of this is, I hope, self-evident. Uh, um, you can take this substance and turn it into street-level uh, uh, sales at an amazing profit ratio. Um, the problem is it's extremely difficult to cut because of its incredible uh, concentration of, uh, of uh, opioid uh, uh, power. Um, the uh, several equivalent of you that don't think in micrograms like myself, um, um, the equivalent amount that's lethal is, is amounts to several grains of salt. Um, and the uh, only that's way... Le that's lethal. Yes. And the only way to cut this, if you were really going to cut it, would be to liquefy it with a cutting agent. Uh, and then if you want to produce a powder, then bring it back out of liquid into a powder. Um, organizations and individuals are not doing that. Um, in New England, they're using a blender and taking things like lactose and other things and putting it in a blender. The people doing these and that they've arrested in various hotel rooms and other places um, are wearing breathing apparatus. But keep in mind, this also can come uh, into the human body through the surface of the skin and uh, um, is extremely dangerous to handle. In fact, when they find these sites, they have to use uh, hazmat suits and do a full uh, 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 toxic site cleanup on these. But at any rate, they're being put into blenders and being mixed, which means that when this is sold on the street under those circumstances, it can't really be mixed that way. So that every dose has a different concentration of the actual fentanyl in it. In addition, I have learned subsequently that uh, a number of these groups are importing from Asia, many times China, apparently, although the government doesn't know the entire scope of this, both because of the data they're not collecting and don't know, and also because the uh, uh, phenomenon is expanding quite rapidly. They're importing uh, fentanyl and then uh, creating um, um, uh, counterfeit pills of oxycod and other hydro, other kinds of uh, uh, pills of abuse and selling them as the legitimate uh, uh, medication, also causing overdose deaths by people who think they're buying um, uh, uh, controlled pharmaceuticals. Uh, the magnitude of this is is difficult to measure. In in Manchester, I was told the um, uh, they are having one overdose death per day, not all lethal. And in the state of New Hampshire, they're now at one overdose death per day on the state. Um, other areas are reporting extremely rapid increases in overdoses and, and overdose deaths, uh, although, the, as I say, the government system on surveillance is far from what it needs to be. Um, as you can see, um, the parcel post problem here is enormous. There are hundreds of millions of packages coming into the country from these, uh, uh, from China and these other countries where there's no advanced electronic data. There's no ability to screen them against databases as a result because no one can keystroke in the stuff once it arrives in the United States. There's no way to use the data of what's coming in and therefore to, to do investigations retrospectively. There's no way to anticipate what's coming in and stop uh, uh, that flow. Uh, they told me in New Hampshire that uh, individual, uh, they occasionally have overdoses and uh, uh, seized drugs that, are, that they do find are directly shipped from China. These are particularly da dangerous and causes of overdose because those are, are much purer uh, concentrations of fentanyl and um, uh, which make them much more dangerous to handle and to use, as well as this inept effort to try to cut it that causes uh, uh, the user uh, to be at extreme risk of overdose and death. Um, again, it is probable that the 2014 numbers have been exceeded and that tens of thousands of Americans have and are continuing to die from fentanyl overdose being sold as everything from heroin to, uh, uh, over, to uh, abused pain medication. In fact, when I was in, Mas Nashua, or in Manchester, New Hampshire, they told me that a little over a year ago, they were seeing um, primarily an overdose problem connected with heroin, heroin coming from uh, Mexico. 
Then, about uh, nine to 12 months ago, they started to see heroin, which was adulterated with fentanyl. So they were mixing fentanyl and heroin. Now, it almost is completely fentanyl. They're not even bringing heroin, and there's been a huge increase in heroin production in Mexico. So the amount of uh, addiction, the amount of, uh, of, of uh, pathological consequences from this substances, these mixing of substances and substitution is enormous. You can see the financial value of this. Now, that leaves aside the problem, as I said to you, um, 2.2 pounds of fentanyl is 500,000 overdose if you can dis d deliver it. Um, it is extremely dangerous to handle and it, and it will, it, and dust of it can, can uh, enter the air. You saw perhaps a report here about a SWAT team in the area that went in and, and uh, fentanyl was uh, 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 aerosolized in the air, risking those people's lives. What I heard in Manchester was one team of officers went into a, uh, a room where they were uh, cutting or trying to cut fentanyl and one of the offenders with the breathing apparatus threw a bag of fentanyl into a sink to cause the dust to rise up and to uh, cause the officers to be rendered unconscious or killed. The officers were able to back out of the room quickly. One of them was hospitalized, but they, uh, uh, they were uh, um, uh, fortunately not injured. Um, releasing fentanyl into a closed space is a mass casualty weapon. This is a very easy substance to weaponize. In fact, some of you may remember the Russians used a fentanyl gas to, to, in a theater uh, that was seized by terrorists uh, some years ago. Some people died in that because they couldn't control the, uh, the amount uh, delivered. But um, this is not just a substance abuse problem. This is an obvious, and people have talked about this, terror weapon that can be shipped now and delivered by the United States Postal Service under the arrangements that uh, uh, we have now talked about. Without some kind of screening and control, without the ability to have electronic tracking to help uh, track down these groups and to stop the flow, uh, we're going to see many more deaths. And again, I, I assume from the, all the data that we're seeing that the number of casualties already and that are mounting now are several times the number of Americans killed on 9-11 are going to come from this source. So, uh, um, uh, and it could be quite staggering. Uh, the government doesn't entirely know, and it's not moving rapidly enough, in my opinion, to try to figure this out. But right now, this is the most dangerous threat uh, uh, across our country, and um, it's partly, in, and we don't even know how much of it, is being delivered by the United States Postal Service under arrangements uh, in the international uh, uh, system of uh, postal exchange, and the United States Postal Service is even delivering it below cost. Um, so um, this is an outrageous situation that um, um, uh, needs to be fixed. A number of parts of it need to be fixed, but it's not going to get fixed if we don't change the way in which this is coming into our country. And again, to stress, this is not the U.S. Postal Service's fault. This is the result. They don't want to be delivering these drugs. They don't want to have, they would love to have the kind of data about what they are, in fact, what is being shipped into this country. It already provides... Is, is able to provide that data about shipments that are outbound to other foreign countries here, but the U.S. Postal Service finds itself in many ways stuck in a situation where it's caught between the rules that the UPU has imposed and the lack of a technology that will allow f other foreign countries to supply them with the information that we need in order to get that done. I want to come back to this question about, this is one of the most, I have to say, scarier things that we discovered in this commission is this is the possibility of weaponizing fentanyl here. Because when you think about the role of international packages uh, as for possible use by terrorist groups, whether it's to deliver bombs or to deliver parts of bombs to uh, uh, deliver bombs as they tried to do in the case of in, in 2010 with, uh, with UPS, or whether it's the case of delivering uh, materials that would be useful to a terrorist cell in the United States through uh, through foreign uh, through postal uh, postal service. Um, you have to understand that, of course, this the materials that go by by air, carried by companies like uh, United and American and other international um, airlines, as we learned. Those mail bags containing that are screened in the same way in which they screen 
luggage that goes into the belly of airplanes and shipped in that way. Um, but the ability to screen for fentanyl, which is being shipped for the use as a, as a weaponized agent and so on, would be missed in a way in which a bomb or explosive parts would be, would be, uh, would be, would be identified and be removed from those, from those packages. So we have here a substance which is not only very, very dangerous to individual users, but also could be enormously dangerous, as you say, in use in confined spaces, a subway car, an airplane, um, a, a, a theater, um, any number of places where a terrorist might want to strike and have a kind of unbelievable impact on the number of the people who are involved with it. Well, in, in detection, most of this, if not all of it, is screened for uh, by radiation sensors as it comes through various uh, uh, convey conveyor areas or it goes on to certain uh, transport. Um, some of it, it can be uh, x-rayed or imaged in other with other technologies. So if it looks like a bomb and it's imaged, it will probably be detected. But if it looks like a bag of talcum powder or a bag of, uh, uh, of something else, uh, powdered glaze coming from uh, artisan uh, 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 supply uh, or a variety of other things, or it can be reduced in a variety of ways. I mean, people have smuggled uh, uh, other drugs of abuse and various kinds of uh, uh, packaging and so forth for a long, long time. If it doesn't have any uh, other way, if you don't have any other way of detecting it, because it's not radioactive, it doesn't look like a piece of material that's dangerous, then it's extremely hard to catch if you're going to try to catch it, it through uh, mass sorting. You got to have intelligence. You got to be able to look for it. You got to be able to have controls, and you have to be able to kind of follow up and stop it before it uh, uh, is delivered. Right now, on the hundreds of millions of these packages, it's completely impossible. Now, of course, John, dealing with this illegal drug trafficking, and particularly, and just one example being that of fentanyl, clearly <laughs> finding ways to gather data about or. Uh, for packages that are coming into the country and so on, isn't going to stop that kind of a traffic. It's not. It may. It may have certain kinds of repercussions on that. But dealing with these, with narco terrorism and the range of other sorts of activities they're engaged in, requires a much larger uh, policy, uh, a perspective than simply focusing on how these drugs happen to get into the country through foreign posts and so on. And yet, at the same time. I think one of the most interesting witnesses that we had for our discussion with commission was from Customs and Border Protection. And John Hudak, I think one of the things that we got from that, from her testimony, and also from other witnesses that we spoke to, was the degree to which um, they are, as an institution, worried about all of these problems. Lost customs revenues, of course, the drug, the illegal drug trafficking, the threat of terrorism, the, uh, uh, the advantage, the unfair advantages that foreign e-commerce companies get from this. And yet the constant refrain from this and from others was give us the data. Find some way to give us advanced data about what's coming in and we can deal with so many more of these problems. But that's got to be one of the main focuses of, of where this goes and where this commission feels that one of the major steps has to be in going forward. That's right. So advanced electronic data reporting for, uh, for mail, for the shipment of goods, is absolutely essential for a variety of reasons. Chief among them is dealing with this flow of threats, whether the threat is materials for terrorism, whether it is illegal drugs, again, particularly fentanyl, which um, John was saying during the commission, uh, has to be sealed if it's shipped so tightly. Uh, because if there is a leak, a custom agent, customs agent is at risk. The dogs can be killed, and there have been examples of that. Um, the dogs trained to sniff this, if they sniff loose granular fentanyl, will either be sick or killed, which immediately is a set off. So these have to be sealed in such tight ways where other drugs that may not necessarily uh, be such a necessity it is for fentanyl, whether it is uh, consumer goods that are produced um, at subquality levels, whether they are a variety of other products that are coming into the United States that shouldn't be. Uh, Customs and Border Protection, the U.S. Postal Service, commercial carriers, government-wide, there are concerns about this. And 
for background, the commercial carriers uh, were required to start submitting advanced electronic data under the Trade Act of 2002. Um, that, the provision of that law that requires this from the commercial carriers is under a heading about terrorism. And I, I think the events of the past couple of days can help uh, crystallize uh, for Americans how real those threats are on American soil. And it's not to say that the materials used in the attacks in New York and New Jersey uh, came through the mail, but the opportunity is there for materials to come through uh, the Postal Service in that way. This is a threat to Americans in every city. Uh, this is a threat to our customs agents. This is a threat to our postal carriers. I think we saw that uh, in late, uh, late 2001 and into 2002 with anthrax attacks uh, in, in the United States. Who bore the brunt of those casualties? The United States Postal Service. Uh, so these are real threats. Um, whether, again, whether they're drug-related, product-related, or terrorism-related, uh, and for the Postal Service, they have very little information about the source of these packages. Uh, they know, obviously, where they're going, but they don't know the contents of the packages. They don't know the value of the packages. And all of that information is vital. Now, one can say, well, it's easy if you're a narco trafficker or uh, you're trafficking in, um, you know, imposter goods or if you're a terrorist, you're just going to lie on the forms. Sure. That's right. But there's two forms of enforcement here that are essential. Uh, one is enforcement during the process of mailing, and that is being able to identify products, being able to identi identify certain patterns, certain behaviors, certain sources, whether they are sources at the national level or sources down to an individual level or network level, um, being able to identify what a package looks like. Um, or certain routes that packages travel to be able to identify um, possible uh, sticking points in the system, possible risks, possible vulnerabilities. That's one side. The other side of enforcement is forensic. That is, after there is a problem, being able to trace the routes that packages took, being able to interview individuals who handled those packages along the way, the individuals they came into contact with, perhaps memory of the mailer, him or herself. Uh, under, in, for the United States Postal Service, there is very limited ability to do that because of that lack of advanced electronic data reporting. Now, in the Trade Act of 2002, uh, commercial carriers are required to submit to these uh, data requirements. USPS, their requirements to submit to this are at the discretion of the administration, at the discretion of the Treasury Secretary and the Postmaster General, who thus far have not felt an urgency in having the Postal Service comply with the same things that UPS and FedEx and others comply with. Well, that's a challenge. Um, it's a challenge for a variety of reasons. First, terrorists are not too snobbish to use the U.S. Postal Service. It's not as if there is some institutional or systematic reason why terrorists will only use UPS or they're not going to be terrorists anymore. They're going to use whatever form they can get access to. And if we know one thing from international terrorist organizations, from narco-terror organizations, even from domestic terror organizations, they identify vulnerabilities in the system and they capitalize on it. Well, this is a serious vulnerability. And so it is incumbent upon the administration to start requiring the Postal Service to comply with the same types of data reporting and database management and communication with the Customs and Border Protection uh, to be able to strengthen security um, and to overcome these vulnerabilities which are real and in the short, medium, and long term uh, really, really put this nation at risk. I think, too, when, when we heard testimony from commercial carriers, uh, they talked a lot about these requirements. Now, in, in some businesses, you would have a situation where a, a company would come in that is subject to tremendous reporting requirements from the government, and they would say, this isn't fair, this is too burdensome, it's too much bureaucracy, it's too much red tape. That's not the testimony we heard. There wasn't even that much discussion about it being unfair that USPS can do this and we have to do that. 
they were actually, in a sense, proud of the systems that they put into place as private carriers to say every parcel that comes in, we know what's inside. We look inside before it's sealed. People create accounts to ship with us. There are offices all over the world that allow UPS and FedEx and others to have a much better accounting of the products that are in their chain of custody from sender to receiver. And as Jim said, what helps motivate that among commercial carriers is their liability if there's a problem. USPS doesn't have liability if there's a problem in their control of a product in the chain. But UPS and FedEx, they have that liability, and so that motivates them to get this right. And they're very good at it, frankly. And so being able to create a parallel system within the Postal Service as the commercial carriers do, first off, there's legal authority to do it already under the Trade Act. There is obviously a national security interest in doing that, regardless of what you think that threat is, even beyond terrorism. And there's a real need in understanding that is the number of parcels increase as a part of the entire mail system, which has already happened significantly over the past few years, and as Jim's chart showed, is going to skyrocket over the next few years. The opportunities for these types of negative events, flows of drugs, flows of products, will only increase as well. And as the ability to deal with them remains stagnantly low, you will find organizations and individuals becoming more aware of those vulnerabilities and, again, capitalizing on them because the data reporting just isn't there to stop them. I'm going to have a few concluding remarks. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, John. And then we're going to open it up to questions. From my perspective, it seems to me that there are going to be two really landmark events taking place in the next six weeks that can really change and shape the future direction of these problems and of addressing issues and reforms that need to be addressed. The first is the meeting of the UPU Congress in Istanbul that starts tomorrow. The 21st, I think, is the first plenary session. Our fellow commissioner, Jim Campbell, is going to be going to Istanbul for that event. When do you leave, Jim? Tonight. Tonight. Do you prefer window or aisle? Anything in business. So we'll be able to get a first-hand account of what goes on there, what's taking place. And I say landmark event because this is an opportunity now, as the Congress debates and then votes on the new conventions, the ones that will be governing the international postal package system up through 2021, the U.S. has the opportunity here now to decide whether it will agree with or disagree to comply with those new conventions and the steps that have been taking place there. That's number one. The second landmark event is the presidential election. Now, I'm not thinking and I'm not suggesting, and the commission isn't hoping, that this now becomes a major issue in the debates between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump over the next couple of presidential debates. That's expecting too much. But what can happen is that as the next president and the next administration becomes aware of the gravity of the issues that are involved here in terms of reforming the international postal package system, issues relating to America's economic competitiveness, issues relating to national security, issues relating to the health and safety of our communities and our children, that these are issues then that will demand the attention of a new presidential administration that will require some additional focus and that a new administration working together with Congress 
can then push forward on a series of important reforms and a series of important changes. Changes that we will be talking about and laying out in the final version of our report. What I want to do right now is just give you a quick preview of what we think those directions will look like and who the key players will be. Because this is one of the most important things, I think, to bear in mind about this. You don't mind if I get down here off of the platform? This is one of the most important aspects, I think, to realize is, is that this is a complex problem. You've seen that, all the different players that are involved in this. It's a complex problem that involves lots of moving parts and lots of different players who need to step out to be part of a reform and, 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 and a new direction of change, not just the U.S. Postal Service. I think this is one of the key aspects to realize. They become the primary beneficiaries as well as key players in this if the right kinds of reforms and changes that take place. So who are we talking about? Well, the Commission decided that the best way to organize and think about the issue of reforming international postal package system and the U.S. Postal Service's role in it is to think of it in, in two groups of issues. One group being economic issues, particularly those that concern the sticky problem of what's called terminal dues, namely the amount of money that foreign postal services pay to the UPS to reimburse the USPS for the service, for the delivery that it does for those packages coming from whether it's China Post or Deutsche Post or any of the other foreign postal systems that take place. Now, in terms of addressing the economic issues that are involved with this, what we can see here is that there's a role very much to be played by the State Department, which in fact has the ultimate authority over the international, uh, America's participation in the international postal package system and in the Universal Postal Union. There's an important role also for the Commerce Department. And here I could also add for the U.S. Trade Representative given the fact that so much of the current system is one that works very much to the disadvantage of America's economic competitiveness, particularly in this growing and burgeoning e-commerce uh, uh, universe where certain foreign countries uh, are able to enjoy basically subsidized service in ways that make it possible, for example, for the fact that, uh, that, that the Chinese e-commerce company uh, here is actually paying less to send a package to an American customer here within the 48 states than is charged to a U.S. company shifting to a fellow American customer within those 48 states. This is an absurd situation, and yet it's one that has developed as a result of UPU rules, and it's one that ought to acquire the interest and focus of commerce and the, and the USTR. The Department of Justice also has a role to play in all these things, to, in its role to play in terms of uh, deciding whether certain practices within the UPU convention constitute violations of, the, of, the, uh, of, of US um, uh, policy regarding antitrust and a range of other kinds of uh, sticky issues, that, legal issues that have to be sorted out. If, if one rules that the UPU, for example, exercises uh, a, a monopoly or a cartel power over U.S., over international postal rates. There's also a role for the Postal Regulatory Commission, which is the body that's supposed to oversee and exercise oversight over U the relationship between US po how the U.S. Uh, Postal Service operates in conjunction with U.S. law and with U.S trade and also national security policy. There's also a role too for the Customs and Border Protection, who also here have spoken to us about the need for important changes that can take place so that they can both gather the data that's necessary to keep track of what's coming into our country through the International Postal Service, but also to collect the money that's due for goods that are dutiable, right? that should be paying some kind of custom dues, but which, under the current system, aren't. And the size of the bill, of the money that, uh, of, of the bill for, that's lost, the money that's lost on that is quite considerable. And finally, there's a role, of course, for the U.S. Postal Service itself to step up and to be an advocate here in the need for reform or for changes that will benefit uh, not only the U.S. 
Postal Service as a whole by making it more efficient and more technologically in touch with this globalized market, the e-commerce market as it begins to explode and begins to expand, but also ones which guarantee its integrity. And even, as John pointed out, too, that even protects the health and safety of its own postal employees. And then finally, there's a question, there's a big role for Congress in all of this as well in terms of its ultimate oversight and of making sure that the statutory and legal framework which it has already put in place gets implemented. It gets implemented in an expeditious and an efficient way. Now the same similar cast of characters uh, come into play from the point of view of the impact of the international postal system on terms of national security and law, and, and law enforcement. Where we have, for example, again, the State Department, which needs to step up and take a more active role in the ways in which the current system is one that tends to undermine America's position in the world and may even pose, a, in some degrees, a peril, a peril to a national security. The role of DHS, for very similar reasons as well, to be part of this overall debate uh, and for addressing these kinds of issues that are involved here. In. Uh, the Customs and Border Protection, again, from the standpoint of national security law enforcement, the USPS, and, of course, Congress, that these are not just issues about trade or lost customs revenue or lost terminal dues, which, again, ought to be an issue for the Postal Service. Why are they subsidizing foreign e-commerce companies? It doesn't make sense. But also that these are issues that impinge directly on the in the national security of the United States and the health and safety of its citizens. Now, in terms of the overall issues and policies that could be put in place, there are three, I think, that, can, that stand out that will be part of the overall picture of policy recommendations that will be developed and be underway here. One, for example, will focus on the role of the State Department and of a suggestion that the oversight authority regarding the UPU, the Universal Postal Union, be shifted from the inter from international organizations, which is where the, the, the secretariat that deals with it currently, to the Undersecretary for Economic Growth, uh, Energy, and Environment, uh, where you have bureaus there that can address this issue, which is now not so much a question about international organizations in terms of humanitarian activities and a range of other sort of things that one thinks about for international multilater multilateral organizations, mm -hmm. but that this is a trade and economic issue, and that therefore that's the expertise and the focus that State Department needs to bring to bear on that. The second, uh, second reform recommendation that the Commission will make will be that customs and border protection work closely with the World Customs Organization towards developing a simplified and uniform electronic customs data form, which can be easily transmitted from country to country and which will be one that will become standard now for all inbound and outbound packages, whether we're talking about within the United States or outside. And then finally, Congress. And, and the need for Congress for passing legislation that will mandate that the U.S. Postal Service um, get advanced electronic customs data on inbound packages into the United States, and that that includes not just, uh, not just large packages but small ones as well, and even flats is one of the things that we discovered in the course of discussion of the Commission was the degree to which flats, in other words, sort of small, sort of large size envelopes, can themselves very often contain illegal, uh, illegal uh, uh, goods, for example, false passports, uh, illegal credit cards, and a range of other sorts of uh, packages which need to be kept track of and kept uh, under, uh, under supervision within the USPS and its, and its databases. Now, there, are, there is already a legislation in Congress uh, for example, the Bipartisan Synthetic Trafficking and Overdose Prevention, or STOP Act, which will require some steps in this direction, such as requiring the USPS to collect that advanced electronic data from foreign countries for inbound packages that would also 
propose making the USPS the importer of record for shipments that are coming into the United States so we have someone who does become responsible and accountable for goods, illegal goods, and other uh, uh, commodities sent by backed actors that would have to deal with that and provide the data for those things. All of these are part of a larger process of bringing about changes and reforms in this. And when our final report is finished in due course, you will all be invited for an event to discuss and to go over and to outline all of the changes that we have in mind. But I wanted to give you here today an idea of the overall direction we're taking and the overall approach that we're underway with this, uh, with this commission and with this important reform effort. Now, from this point here, I'm op happy to open the, open the floor up to questions and to anyone who uh, has anything that they want to ask. The only thing I would ask you to do is before you uh, before you pose your question or comment is just to sort of let us know your name and uh, whatever affiliation you care to disclose. <laughs> John. Yeah, the microphone too. There'll be a microphone too for you as well. John Gizzi with Newsmax. I would like to ask all of the panelists, notably Jim Campbell, um, I'm sure you're aware we're coming up very soon on the 50th anniversary of the Kappa Commission report, which was the prototype for the modern U.S. Postal Service, taking it from a political arm into the current quasi-government form. Uh, vetoed at first, rejected by President Johnson, accepted very immediately by President Nixon, and the rest is history. Question. Was that a good move in light of what you're saying today to change the structure of the post office? Do Second, do we need a new CAPA Commission report that might address some of the concerns of the 21st century and change structurally the USPS once again to deal with some of the things you've spelled out uh, very frighteningly, I might add, today? Thank you. Uh, That's definitely a question for Jim Campbell. <laughs> okay, so first, you know, I think you can, I think you can, you can, I think there are questions that could be raised about the Capital Commission report. Um, it was loaded with businessmen. The Postal Service is not particularly a business problem. However, if you ask me whether the 1970 Reorganization Act overall was a good idea, I think yes, it was definitely a good idea. If you, if you read the history of the development of the Postal Service in the 1950s and the 1960s, Congress decided wages and rates. And they had a terrible problem with wages and rates because they kept raising the rates and not raising the wages. Uh, sorry, raising the wages and not raising the rates. And the Postal Service was perpetually in, in, in uh, debt. Um, so the, the Reorganization Act dealt with some you know, big reforms that were needed. The reorganization is really doesn't really touch on this problem of the the inadequacies the inadequacies of international mail because international mail is only about one quarter to one half of one percent of the mail. Right? In order to survive, in order to thrive, the postal service you need to deal with the other ninety nine and a half percent of the postal service's business. The international matters can be dealt with separately. It should be dealt with separately. And I, I you know, I this was really not dealt with in the nineteen seventy act. The 1970 Act, when it came to international, simply said that the Postal Service will negotiate new international conventions. Well, that really wasn't very thoughtful, because by creating the Postal Service as an independent and really commercially organized operation, they shouldn't be negotiating then in the name of the United States. So the 1970 Reorganization Act, in fact, was a, all, when it comes to international, all they did was repeat the 1872 law. They really didn't think about it. Okay, nonetheless, um, so, you know, the Reorganization Act was good for the Postal Service as a whole, was not very thoughtful when it comes to international. The, the PAEA in 2006 did a good job on the international, as I tried to just show very briefly. Right, but if you ask me whether today the 
Postal Service is in need of another capital commission, another complete reorganization of Title 39. And I would say that the Postal Service faces more challenges, you know, and more fundamental changes in their in their environment than they did in 1970. So I would say yes. I mean, it would be very desirable for Congress to really rethink the whole charter of the Postal Service, what the Postal Service is expected to do, um, how the Postal Service is, is supposed to operate in, in an environment which is really more and more package driven and more and more commercial. But uh, this is that's really quite different from the work of this commission, which is you know, really dealing with a very small part of the Postal Service's operation. I would just add briefly that I think a lot of the challenges that we discussed as a commission, a lot of them, some of them were discussed today, uh, exist despite the organization and structure, structure of the U.S. Postal Service. So I guess the way to set it up is to say, if the Postal Service were operating today as it was pre-1970, would these problems exist? I would say absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind. A lot of them exist because of what the State Department does at the UPU, uh, what Congress has chosen to do uh, with regard to uh, uh, data reporting requirements uh, via the uh, Secretary of the Treasury. And I don't think that the pre-1970 Postmaster General was a powerful enough position to be able to uh, do battle with the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Treasury and win that battle. Um, in a way that is much different than what the Postmaster General's role is today. And so I think Jim is right. There are plenty of problems facing the Postal Service, and another reorganization might be necessary. Some leadership at USPS, like uh, confirming governors to the Board of Governors, would certainly be a step in the right direction. But I think these problems would still largely exist. Next. <laughs> I am J.P. Ducasse with the USPS Office of Inspector General. I have a question regarding uh, data reporting requirements. Um, in our recent research at the OIG, uh, we showed that the use of some new technologies could improve uh, the way this reporting is made. For example, uh, we, it looks like there is an opportunity to, um, to use electronic certified certificates of origin to document not only the shipper, uh, but also the contents of a package, of a cross-border package, but also, you know, changes um, in custody along the processing chain. So I was wondering if that type of new advances, new technologies um, are discussed in your uh, paper. Thank you. I I think that one of the issues that is central to all this, of course, is the technological aspect of this. Um, and if we're going to step forward into a, into a brave new world in which all of the post offices of the world are exchanging information about the packages that they're sending to each other electronically in ways which, again, are both sim simple and uniform, but also easily accessible and and, and, and capable of being used to keep track of, not just keep track of packages, but also to trace back to point of origin for packages that may have turn out to be, uh, have stuff we don't want to have coming into the country. Uh, I think that that's all going to be very much part of it. Um, and that is certainly something which, uh, from the point of view of feasibility, of carrying forward on developing a, let's call it a uniform, advance electronic data universe, those kinds of things are going to be essential. The primary focus for this commission, however, is more on the issue of policy. And I think we have to get that particular uh, horse in front of the cart, and then we can figure out what kind of cart we're going to attach to it uh, and what that cart's going to look like. That would be my view on all this. I don't know if the commissioners agree with me on that. Yeah, I, I think the ideal, uh, or, or at least a, a step in the right direction, would involve ensuring that all of these systems are speaking to each other. So uh, there is certainly a better data reporting system that exists than the one that commercial carriers are using. Uh, but to make sure that if we add the Postal Service to this, that 
uh, Customs and Border Protection can very easily tap into this system. And frankly, I think the ideal would be that UPS and FedEx and others are also in a system where all of these data sources can speak to each other when necessary, not necessarily to break down trade, uh, you know, trade privacy and things like that, but, uh, but so that when there is an event, whatever that event is, a terrorist attack, um, a shipment of, of chemicals or uh, of drugs, that you, we can figure out very quickly through a uniform system. I think the biggest challenge in this government is every agency, one of the biggest challenges in this government is every agency creating their own data set and those data sets not uh, being uniform in any way. And so I think the first step is to at least get uh, the Postal Service up to up to grade and then move forward from there with future reforms. Yeah, I, I think part of this is we shouldn't let greater sophistication get in the way of kind of learning to walk. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, um, we have very sophisticated uh, databases we can put together from a variety of places to to look at anomalies and figure out which subset of things might be war warrant uh, additional scrutiny as well as do forensic analysis after the fact. But right now when you have millions and millions of packages that have no electronic data, you can't use any of those data sets. You can't stop, you don't even know where they are. Um, and and, the, and the, uh, uh, the inability to do that, I mean we already have commercial examples of technologies that, that kind of help us and practices that follow through. But in this realm where the vast majority of packages are coming and where there is now growing evidence of a serious threat as well as growing evidence of a need to, to be uh, economically uh, uh, forward-looking in the mass of material in a kind of global Amazon you're going to see here going on in the next few years so we can both collect appropriate duties, appropriate costs, know what's going on, handle uh, fraud and, and criminal and terrorist and drug trafficker activity. I mean, it, we're, we're way behind on this. And, um, and it's not something, there could be new things that really help a lot, but there's, there's examples of things that exist today in the commercial market that have not been applied that would make a significant difference and would narrow the set of things you have to scrutinize. I do think, you know, having confidence about some of the shippers, about about looking at different kinds of uh, of trigger uh, information that might make you narrow the uh, the category of things you're concerned about, as well as increase the category of things that you consider to be secure, is great. Well, we can't do that now because we just don't use the information on the vast majority of the flow. Yeah. Now, just take a concrete example, just the point of view of point of origin of a package, right? I mean, the people down at CBP know what they're doing, and they know there are certain kinds of countries when packages come in, that sends off an alarm bell. You know, a package that comes in, let's say, from Colombia, or a package that comes in for Yemen, you know, you're going to want to look at that package and you want to sort of see what's going on. But what they have to do now is you have to go down to the warehouse where all this mail has been unloaded from the planes and you have to search through the bags of mail and find the ones that are from Yemen, the ones from Colombia or from the other country point of origin that you're worried about. You know, just think about what it would be like if the CB, instead of having to do that, and you'd have a CBA, a CBP agents able to simply at a glance, look through electronic data and be able to keep track of where those packages are and who they are and look for patterns and so on. That's what we would be aiming for. This is what I know USPS would love to have also in cooperation with other countries too, but that's what doesn't exist now. In fact, I think one of the things that we all agreed on in the commission at the end was is that the degree to which we realize that to a large extent the American public doesn't realize just how vulnerable the system is. That Americans, I think many of them, think we already do all this stuff. We don't. The, 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 the process by which CBP is forced to operate, with the exception of private carriers, but with regard to foreign postal services, the crude and rudimentary ways in which they have to operate in order to screen out and protect us and to collect uh, customs duties is amazing. It's appalling. And one of the things that I think this commission report would do to really highlight that in ways, in vivid ways, they're going to make it clear to the public something's really got to change, and it's got to change fast. Let me just make one other point that, uh, on the drug side. Um, 
We don't have enough information to tell for sure. But a lot too long ago, when I was in government, major trafficking organizations, because of the value of the product and because you're dealing basically with criminals in your workforce, wanted somebody accountable for the shipment of these, uh, these drugs. They would ship them in various quantities, but they would have somebody with them. Even if they put it in a container in a ship, there'd usually be somebody on the crew who was responsible. I mean, they had a very rigorous accountability system. If something, if they got misplaced, you and maybe you and your family will be harmed. So they kept somebody with the material for the most part. Um, and we didn't see as much uh, kind of random shipping. When there was, there was somebody who was generally in the vicinity who was keeping an eye on it for them. The concentration you're seeing with fentanyl, and of course, let me just point out, there are a variety of analogs of these substances, some of which are even more concentrated in their, in their psychoactive effect. So this is the beginning. It now allows you, at a low cost, to send things in small quantities, and if you lose it, it doesn't make any difference because you can make some more. The, the cost, I was told, in Manchester for uh, roughly a kilo of fentanyl is about $60,000. As I said, it can be made into 10 million dosage units. So um, if, if, you, if you lose it through uh, some kind of uh, occasional uh, interception, um, that's, a, that's a well within the cost of doing business. And um, so you're going to see more of that in this vein, I presume. And you're already seeing it, it kind of explode. That now shipping is the vector for delivering some of these products. And obviously you can bounce them off different ports if you want to, you can uh, do this in a variety of ways, but if we can't begin to kind of look at that, you're gonna see an enormously dangerous substances move, moving through this vector at larger and larger rates and at more and more deadly price. I think, let me just mention one thing. Jean-Philippe, I mean, I, I, I would like to say that you know, I know, we know that the Postal Service, CBP, UPU, many people in, in uh, advanced post offices are also concerned about these data issues. This is, um, a, we do not mean to overlook that. Uh, and I know that uh, various people are working on tests. We all know, we've heard from customs that, um, that the uh, CBP and, and some foreign Posts are working on uh, tests now to improve the flow of data. Um, we will take that into account, but the reality is that the, uh, the the difference between the data supplied on virtually all goods that come into the country and the data that's supplied for goods imported by post is is today a difference between night and day. So we, we have to keep in track both perspectives. Other questions, comments? Uh, my name is Bruce Marsh. I'm also from the Postal Service Office of Inspector General. And um, I know you mentioned in, um, in the remarks about uh, incentivizing FedEx and UPS um, because of liability issues and concerns over liability and getting them um, to, uh, to use advanced data systems and implementing those. And I'm just curious, I mean, I know um, um, you know, in terms of incentivizing foreign posts to do the same thing, uh, or foreign customs authorities, um, I don't know if that's within your you know, something that you're going to look at within your 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 work as a commission. But it seems to me it would be very interesting to to look into. Um, how do you do it? I mean, these you know a lot of these posts. I mean, the, the industrialized posts, like you said, are concerned, but there are also a lot of developing country posts. Um, they don't have uh, don't have the you know the postal service like you said is not liable, but um, how do you how do you incentivize them? What's the you know is it ultimately cutting off shipments to the U.S.? Uh, I mean, what's the ultimate kind of threat? You know, what's the carrot approach on that? Uh, I know, I guess back when passports had to be upgraded and you know with the RFID, I guess there was some of that uh, in terms of threatening. I'm just curious if that's one of the things that you're going to look into. Oh, very much so. In fact, we had considerable discussion on just that point. How do you incentivize uh, foreign posts to cooperate, if for nothing else, just the starters with the supplying of advanced electronic data? 
And I think one of one of the advantages of having USPS uh, become importer of record from that standpoint was that then the USPS and the federal government will have strong incentives to get them to cooperate. That this becomes, in a sense, leverage that we can use to sort of say, okay, this is our situation. We've now become officially, we've now become uh, liable for the kinds of shipments that come in for misidentification on customs forms and a range of other things. Now it's your turn to get your act together and to find ways in which to fix and deal with these kinds of problems. And my own, my own impression, Jim knows more about this than I do, but I think it's important to realize that when we're talking about this package shipment explosion that's taking place, right? They don't use that with any degree of accidental humor. I'm simply talking about the growth of e-commerce and the way in which it's led to this transformation of what international postal shipments look like, right? Packages. That much of this flows from a handful of countries, really. That if you take all the industri advanced industrialized countries, you take the major players in e-commerce, and basically, if you can address the issues relating to those, you've largely solved the problem. And the other smaller countries that would be involved in the ones that would, for example, face enormous technological barriers to be able to supply the U.S. with, you know, advanced electronic data and so on, that these become, in a sense, special considerations that could be taken into account for and dealt with in a variety of ways. What we're really dealing with is a much more, I think, containable problem and one in which the number of players, although they are numerous, uh, it by no means is the same as the universe of 192 member nations yeah. in the UPU. Is that, I think that's a good way to characterize it, Jim? There are somewhat two points of view on this, or two perspectives. From an economic standpoint, or from a fairness standpoint, or from, from a fair competition standpoint, you can concentrate on the big, the big countries and solve most of the problems without imposing on foreign posts that are incapable of preparing the, uh, the information. On the other hand, from a security standpoint, um, I, you know, I think my sense is that the customs people and the security people are equally concerned about matters which are not of great economic, or flows that are not of, perhaps of great economic significance, but they're worried about Yemen. You know, are they worried about uh, what are labeled as individual shipments from grandma? You know, because from their standpoint, that poses the same threat as a, as a shipment from, uh, or as the e-commerce shipments from China. So I, it, this has to be dealt with somehow. I, I don't exactly know what we're going to say, but, um, but, but it, we, it's a problem. <laughs> I think you're right. I'm not a diplomat. I want to emphasize that by what I'm going to say here. But one of the things we talked about just as a kind of, you know, what, what, are, the, what, what are the possible ways this could unwind of, uh, 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 in terms of going forward? Um, let, let's take the most, maybe the most extreme case. Let's suppose the United States said it was going to set aside the international agreement. What would happen? Well, what would probably happen, as we talked about, is we would immediately get bilateral agreements with the major uh, other countries, mostly the countries who are also, you know, involved with us in trade, many of them who are capable of providing more advanced uh, information and sharing. We would continue this going, and we would incentivize people who were not making those bilateral lateral agreements to create a plan to come online more quickly in a systematic way suited to where we judge them to be and where we want them to go. So in a certain way, it's it's possible that the bundling of everybody together here creates uh, a kind of limitation that a, a slightly more radical approach might unbundle and create. Now, again, I recognize how disruptive that might be for the people who have to work in this environment, and I recognize why there may be many reasons not to do this. On the other hand, it's a cost-benefit analysis, right? I mean, how serious is this? How do you get to where you, how much do you think you need to get to one place rather than another place, and how do you get there? So um, I, I don't, I think, Look, you will quickly see, obviously, if this international, if the current international agreement is begin to, starts to begin to look like a suicide pact, the, the members will start opting out. And, and, uh, uh, and the United States might be in the position where that becomes an increasing problem if just the, the, the narcotics 
and the terrorism threat it starts to escalate, as I believe it already is. So, uh, um, you know, again, we'd all like to do this in a more measured way. We'd like to bring everybody along. We'd like to have good relations. I'm not for being a bull in a china shop. But on the other hand, it does seem to me there are things at our disposal, given where the United States is and what people want to have as a relationship with the United States here, that gives us quite a few tools that we're not using. Yeah, more leverage than we've used to present. Anything else? Well, thank you very much for joining us and uh, for your questions and your attention. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you, most of you, when we uh, finally re release our, uh, our final report in due course. Thank you very much. Yeah.